Hey, welcome to our show, Truth Hurts. Today I have my friend Brian Goldstein and our new friend, Roger Rojas, content CEO. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, Raj. So born and raised in Miami, Florida, uh, spent 18 years there, grew up. And then at 18, I went to New York to do my undergraduate degree at Iona University, where I spent four years there. And then third year that summer is where I had a Gatorade internship. And that's where I put a camera in my hand. And then I spent Gatorade the next internship. Yeah. Marketing Gatorade oh, internship. Yeah. Great place. Yeah. <laughs> I love the Gatorade story too, about starting in, in, in Florida for the, you know, for the Gators and stuff. It's pretty cool. I forget the story. I know I've heard it though. It was Gator aid. It was literally because they were like so tired playing football that they had to find something with electrolytes and salts in it to like keep those kids running. And they did, and they won the national championship and Gatorade was born. Oh shit. Yeah. That's a great place to start marketing though. Cause they've really had like multiple different generations of, yeah. of changing 100%. and then gaining market share and then losing it. And I mean, they basically built sports drinks also. I mean, they were the number one first, you know, Powerade came after them, but now it's, it's such a, now it's a, a free huge, yeah. you probably know what the market share now is like. Well, actually the internship I had was to tackle the high school market. So what they did is they uh, bought an ambulance, painted it black and mm -hmm. put the Gatorade logo on the side. And then what I did it was started in Miami and it was two others. And we hit oh. every major city throughout the West, East Coast. Just driving. And driving. Uh, predominantly Florida. And what we did was when we got there, we would do three things. The, the Are you basis... responsible for the pepino? For the cucumber? No. <laughs> that shit's fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. No products. So okay. my, my, my uh, purpose. Street was, team type stuff. Yeah. Um, the the, Brand the basis of it was we were educating high school students on the importance of hydration by marketing Gatorade products. Mm -hmm. And so what we would do is, number one, you had the pre, which was a chewable at the time. I don't think they sell there or do that anymore. This was back in 2015. Uh, and then the seen. during, which is what we know, the actual drink. And then the post. They had like post protein shakes and protein bars. Okay. So most of these kids that we were speaking to, they had top 10 players in every uh, sport. So yeah. these were kids that were gonna go pros in less than three years. Yeah. And so two of my friends would be in the front educating them on the three. And then once they were done with that, they would come with me in the back of the van and, sounds terrible, in the back of the van, <laughs> where I would take a picture of them, we would put their face on a Gatorade bottle and they would uh, take it home. Yeah. That's, that's pretty sweet. That's inspiration, yeah. bro. So during that, exactly, yeah. um, I thought, I saw them doing two things, right? They're putting a Gatorade bottle in their hand. These are future athletes that are mm -hmm. gonna be pro. Uh, number two, we're educating on them on why they should be drinking Gatorade. And number three, we made it fun. Like we had music blasting, we had a future playing, you know, like vibing with them. We would ask them questions, take pictures. And it was during that process I spent about, I want to say three to six weeks doing that, that it led to me being curious about content creation. So yeah. I was doing that to, you know, garnish photos and videos that would then be sent to Gatorade for them to be like, hey, what are you guys doing? What's the update? What does it look like? And this I had an infancy of, of Instagram stage, right? It's basically uh, like relatively. Yeah, this relatively. is one. Yeah, still, relatively, this is one people were taking pictures. Yes. And they posting. were taking food yeah. pictures and, and pictures. Random. That's when like videos were like 10 seconds. If 15 even. seconds. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's but it was exactly still, it was like, it was basically Instagram was for taking pictures. Correct. Twitter was more for communicating. Yeah, like by no point. means was it meant for business. Yeah. And uh, around that time, I had a family friend who had his own production company and he was doing uh, professional drones. And these were drones when they weren't, you know, you can't go to Best Buy to buy them. He was this doing was it. Long before yeah, DJI. long before DJI kind of, I, I should say they were around, but the idea is like, he had things that you couldn't go to the local store and buy, right? No Target, no CVS, nothing like that to buy a drone. And he had a photographer on his team who I admired. And I said to him, I, I hit him up as soon as I finished the Gatorade internship. And it was like a week in between uh, me going back to school. And I said to him, hey, can I shadow him? I just want to see what it's about, like to have that life of being a photographer and just learn as much as I could. I spent the whole day with him. And I still vividly remember this as we're driving home. It's a family friend of ours. And he's about to drop me off. And he says, hey, I have something for you. It's in the back. And I look in the back. It's a Nikon bag and it's a camera. And I was just like, what is this? He's like, well, this is our old camera. He's like, I want to give this to you, but you have, I have one thing that you have to do. I said, what? He's like, you need to go back to your school and make as many videos as you can. And promise me if I give it to you, you'll do that. I said, done. So I immediately went back to school. Um, again, no experience with having this camera at all. And I did what anyone else would do. I just started asking friends of like, yo, you guys want to shoot a video? You want to take pictures? My focus of my circle is my fraternity. And we had, you know, rush coming up for the fall. So I made like a hype video of Dumb. why you should rush in my fraternity, Pi Kappa Phi. That got the attention of the school. 
my school then saw we had this local charity where we would dance. The term was a dance marathon for 24 hours that was raised for cancer research for the local hospital. That's cool. So then I did the promo video. There was a dance competition video, and my video was the promo video for other people to like emulate. Wow, that's bad. So then yeah, so now my school is like, okay, cool. There's a videographer, and I went to a small private Catholic school. I'm not you know no big university. This was max 4,000 undergrads. So it's like I was one of the few with a camera, especially doing video. People were taking pictures, but no one was really doing video. Yeah. And then that got attention of a local restaurant across the street from my school. And the owner would see me and he's like, hey, I see your videos. I think they're super cool. Um, I can't pay you, but you could eat here for free as much as you want, as long as you want. Wow. I said as many times as I want. <laughs> I was living off campus. And for anyone that lives off campus, you know, that's like, I was like, yo, three times, five times, like, as many times as you want, you'll be good. I said, all right, cool. Free so food, bro. exactly free <laughs> barter food. system i love it yeah and then i started the instagram taking pictures of food yeah uh, making hype videos we kind of that was my one of my first quote-unquote viral videos it was like a 30 second ad that he made for facebook got like a quarter half a million views something crazy yeah. in like 48 hours and it was showcasing like the food process it was like a stir fry showing the fire throwing the food up in the air Dope. and yeah and that during that time they had a meal prep company and this is a great story if you never know the person that you're around and the influence they'll later have in your life. So there was my junior year prior to my senior year where I took an elective dance class. Again, I went to school for business, not arts, no nothing. It was an elective dance class. It was between dance or sculpting. And I took dance. And there was an individual in that class that now is one of my best friends that utterly changed my life. He was helping out at that restaurant for a meal prep company. And at that meal prep company for the restaurant, they would get nutritional advice from a trainer. He was that trainer, this guy that I took dance class with, right? He now saw what I was doing with the restaurant. He approaches me, he sent me a message actually, and he's like, hey, I've seen the videos, they're pretty dope. I'm opening up a gym about like two, three miles from the school. Um, I would love some promo videos, what do you charge? And at that point, I had never been paid a dollar. You were just doing do the barter system? Yeah, yeah, I barter, I was just kind of helping out friends. I was a cool guy with the camera, kind of. I don't even know what that was, of like, you know, what it, what it would be like. There wasn't no positions for that. And that was my first paid job. He paid me a hundred bucks for three 15 second videos. And again, this is one Instagram it was 15 seconds. And it was hype videos that was then showcasing the creation of the gym. He then said to me, Hey, I love how this came out. Can you come? We're going to like, can you film us bringing the equipment in? I said, sure. And then that turned into, as you would expect the equipment to filming that classes to filming the grand opening. And I never publicly have ever said this, but I think this is a great testimony towards like, you just figure it out and make stuff happen. During my spring semester, the biggest rush times of a fitness gym are when? Between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. And then it's 3.30, give or take till 7, right? When people get out of work. So 4.30, 5.30, 6.30, especially for fitness classes in regards of like population, uh -huh. right? I had a class from 3.30 to 6.30. And so what did that mean? I wasn't able to film the classes. There were times, and again, I was a good student. I was very involved, never, you know, don't promote this. But the idea was I had to figure it out. And he said to me, there was a couple times during the week, he was like, hey, I need you to film the 3.30 class. I need you to film the 4.30, but I had class. So it was a handful of times where I'd walk into business class, they would take attendance. I would turn around, pay the kid five, 10 bucks, tell him where I live and just be like, yo, I'm gonna leave my laptop and my backpack here as I go to the bathroom and just take my stuff back when class is over. And I'll jump in his car and then go to the fitness gym and film the classes. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> yeah. There's a will, there's a way. Right. And uh, just to fast forward to that point, it was May, 2016. Uh, I don't I was, think a business class would have mind that you were handling business during business class, yeah. right? <laughs> and, but my biggest thing, and I say this like, you know, practically kind of like, you know, I wasn't just skipping class. I was someone who was very involved at my yeah. university, like to the highest degree. Like we had a women's basketball team that had scouting. So I would be on the women's opposing team, acting like the opposing team and train with them three to five times a week. I was a part of my fraternity. Yeah, uh, I was a part of admissions. I would call students and, you know, I'm a Hispanic background, so I would call aspiring other Hispanic students that were on the fence about it. If they had questions in Spanish, if they had questions in English during my junior year, I had four jobs, Tuesdays and Thursdays. I was babysitting or sorry, Tuesdays and Thursdays. I was a waiter at a pizza place. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I was babysitting. And then Tuesdays and Thursday nights I had night class. And then Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I would attend to basketball stuff and also fraternity stuff. So I was very, very, schedule. yeah, I was someone who. I, I was, what I later learned was curious of life. And so through my curiosity, I consistently would figure out, all right, what does that look like? How can I try this or how can I get involved? And that's how I truly believe I found what is now what I do full time, you know? And even then there were still obviously moments, especially between 2016, 2019, I met Dan Fleischman and how we met, um, that I very much questioned my, you know, my worth and what I was doing and how 
what I was, who I was working for and, and, and all that. But ultimately it was just the curiosity that kept me going of, you know, what is this? Where can I get involved? How can I help? How can I serve? Sounds like you got a camera in your hand and you hit the ground running. Heavily. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, figured. and you had it in your mind even before you had the camera. Yeah. I, and, I think it was one of those things where I kept telling myself, and this was advice that I got prior um, leaving from high school to university. So I was, again, I went to a pri private Catholic high school in Miami. I'm one of five. And I was the first sibling to leave my house for university. I'm the fourth. And there was a, a Christian brother pastor there, and he gave me this advice, and I placed everything in life. When I was on the fence about going to school in New York, he said to me, what's the worst thing you could do is try. You try it out. August starts, and by December, if you don't like it, you come back. He's like, the worst thing you could do is have regret of what if, rather than you tried it, it wasn't for you, and you move on. And so I did that with my camera. I, that, that was my thought process the whole time. Every time I had a chance to shoot, every time I yeah. had a chance to connect with someone, I was like, let me just try it. You know, like, let me try to shoot this wedding. Let me try to shoot this baby shower. I had never done it, how'd, but I just tried it. How'd you figure out the editor? Uh, YouTube. Yeah. A lot of YouTube. University yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Look, <laughs> Big yeah, for, YouTube. For every creator, especially now. I, you know, 2015 <laughs> was very different. The landscape. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, now, it wasn't, it wasn't nowhere near where it is today where I could, you know, YouTube and there's 50 videos of how to do X. Um, but I genuinely say, again, I never talk about this, but you know, I, I hit the ground running with that gym. They didn't put me on salary. They were just opening. Yeah. And the owner, he's one of my best friends, Frankie D'Agostino. I love him. And he had 12 trainers on staff and yeah. they were all young trainers and they were just starting out too. So what does that mean? That they didn't have the financial means yeah. to promote and create content on Instagram, nor did they knew it was necessary to do so. hundred percent. And again, it wasn't used for business. So no. I was convincing people to use it for business. So it was the best platform. My first ever retainer, this is gonna sound nuts to anyone listening, this is gonna sound nuts, but I swear to God, I did this. 10 videos, 10 photo shoots a month. Guess how much I would charge a trainer? Thousand bucks? $30. No. Yeah. Jesus. My thought process was I had 10, 12 tra tra trainers on this. I was making 300 plus bucks a month. And again, you have to remember, I had no portfolio. I had no confidence. You're starting from scratch. Yeah, and like, I couldn't even sell myself. There was nothing to sell. Yeah. And so them selling a service that they didn't necessarily want or need but the owner, Frankie, was pushing for, hey, you should hire Roger, hey, you should hire R. I lived in that gym. And so it became genuinely just trial and error of like figuring stuff out over and over and over and over and over. I shot hundreds and hundreds of fitness videos and every time they'd, hey, can you try this? And I would just, they would just drill my head into a computer. You still do a bunch of fitness videos for some of your friends. I yeah, think. now now I, I'm getting back into it. Um, it's definitely something I stepped away from, but in the beginning, it was it was I lived and breathed in that gym, like to the point where they had a second floor bathroom hangout area. Like I even asked them if I could put a bed there. That's how often I was there. Oh, like wow. I have endless videos and photos. Like you could just see the back of my head from the front desk of me just editing. Yeah, that's what it, that's all I did, and this is all I knew, right? And the biggest thing too, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, is my family was traditional. So when I graduated, you know, I'm so thankful. I come from a great family. Um, they took care of a private Catholic high school education, private Catholic college education. Um, big purpose of graduating was my grandmother. And she says to me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to be working at a gym taking pictures. And she looked at me like I've had three heads. And she, genuinely, she said to me, go do whatever you're going to do. May 16, 2016 is the day I graduate. May 20th of 2016, she called me and said, you're complete cut off. You want to do what you're going to do, you figure it out. And it was at that point that I realized it was a blessing and a curse. So obviously that day was like my D-Day. It was like very emotional. But then it also was why I do what I do and how I do it. She gave me that push to, you know, if I'm going to go in, I'm going all in. And there's no like plan B. Perfect. And the whole thing for me was just not just not allowing myself to give up and saying to myself, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go all in. And on, I'm gonna, on like, the flip side of that, it sounds a little... Uh, it can sound cold, but yes. it's really empowering. Right. Again, in that moment, I was yeah. like, how is she like throwing me to the dirt? Yeah. Um, but, but ultimately. It's something that's very hard to do from a parental standpoint. Yeah. And then to give power to, to knowing that that's the only way that like, you know, monsters are created. And so to speak right. in business minded monsters, especially if you want to take a route that's, that's, uh, you know, it wasn't traditional. Like I still remember I had friends, yeah, he, at yes. that time. I still remember I had a friend of mine. He graduated with me from uh, Yankee Candle, the, the candle company, mm -hmm. and he created the social media role. Like that's how like when I was graduating, that that it wasn't even a role in business. Like now it's a standard thing to have. Yeah, yeah. It, times have definitely changed over the last, I'd say, what four Six or five years. Yeah, six what years of, of this. What about uh? So New York. Let's fast forward. Um, 
the pace of New York is obviously like 10x what yeah. Miami is probably. Not right? even close. Yeah. yeah. I always say Miami made and the New York hustle. Yeah. Because that's what it is. Like that city is just so thriving and kind yeah. of. And I'm sure it can't. accelerated you at light speed, right? Because you have no choice. I had I had and so there's many, so much going on. Yeah. So many moments of oh shit, right? And so many moments of growth. Uh, there's one story that I think I like to laugh about. And I think about very often was when I was traveling around the subway during peak hours. So if anyone from New York knows what that means, it means you're sardines in the yeah, subway. Exactly. And at the time I had a drone and the drones that, that were out at the time, they were like the size of that case in front of you. Right. Oh you had yeah. The big boys. I had yeah. the big boys. And so I had a big backpack and during the peak hours, again, new to kind People of New York you. city life, subway People life. hated you. <laughs> exactly. And I kept it on. You were downright a target. <laughs> yeah. Wait, <laughs> this is the point of the story. <laughs> um, I'm there and I still remember it was like two to my right. This older gentleman looks like typical grandfather, white hair, the whole nine. And he goes, hey, asshole, how about you take off your backpack so we can fit more people in the subway? I just look at him, you know, very respectful, especially older people. I said, yes, sir. Take it off. I put it in between my legs. I'm like kind of embarrassed. The whole subway, you know, New York vibes. People don't care. They do care. They're looking. They're laughing the whole nine. And this gentleman's in front of his big dude, trainer, huge. He has headphones on. And I just kind of, I'm in shock. And I look down at him. He's sitting down. And I'm like, man, New York City, huh? He takes off his headphones. This guy's huge. He's yoked. He goes, better he said it than me, huh? And then puts his headphones back on. He puts his head down. And I'm like, man, that is New York at its best. <laughs> of just like the mentality, like, yo, they'll chew you up, eat you up twice, you know? 100%. And uh, that, that, that's what I loved about New York most, though. And I still do. Of Like when I'm in that city, the, the commitment to like, you just got to make stuff happen. And if you don't, because the standard of living is so difficult, is that, yeah, you just won't make it. You know, and that saying, if you could live in New York, you could live anywhere is so true. You know, especially when I moved from New York to Cali, I was like, man, the slow pace down, was so right? slow. Yeah. And I would shoot like, like six, seven events a day in New York. Yeah. I'm talking like full blown biking to one subway to another jog to the other. Yeah. Like I was that that's what I thrived off of. And then here I still remember it was like 2021. I LA. couldn't even pull off three in no. of the traffic. You yeah. know, like at least like you're how far? 12 miles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we're going to have to postpone or right. do it again. <laughs> yes, that's definitely a thing. And yeah, so people that, don't realize that. Well, well, New York is a I mean, not. You know, the, the city is a small, but area. the subway makes it easier to get through New York. It's Versus not just that there's traffic, but you're talking about two miles by 12 miles, bro. Yeah. Imagine if LA was two miles by 12 miles with yeah. all of that packed in, you'd be able to get a lot done, right? Yeah. yeah. What are you traveling? You're traveling three quarters of a mile, which is still kind of a hike, but you can walk it, bro. True. Remember you can walk, get out and walk Manhattan in a couple hours. If you're, you know, right. If you're fast enough, you know, to pretty much get anywhere and they do. Oh yeah. That's why they look at you like you're crazy. Like you're going where? Just walk. Yeah, I, I did all that. I walked. I biked. I yeah. Mopeds. Go. I, I anything I could just figure it out. I did that. But now well, you're eight like, million stories. So that's helpful when you're starting a uh, you know entrepreneurial ship uh, content creation business, right? There's yeah. So much to look at. Probably too much at times to focus on. I think, and that's another thing. When I was starting, everyone would tell me what's your niche, and for me, going back to understanding who I am. And this is for a creator listening and thinking to myself, like, how do I get started? Where do I start? Is like, I went off of what the opportunities in front of me and then also what enticed me. What was I curious about? Yeah. And so. Passion always brings forth the best start, right? Right. And, but the idea was for me is like, what, what's, what, instead of seeking stuff that is not attainable, what's in front of me? Like being resourceful, uh -huh. right? Of the people in front of me, my friends, my family, of like, how can I help them? How can I serve them and what I'm doing? And I became so curious about different facets of niches of fitness, of entrepreneurship, podcasts. Uh, at one point, I was doing music stuff. I was a creative director for an online music company. Like, I did things that was constantly pushing my envelope of what's next or how can I try this? How can I do this? Where that's kind of created my Rolodex where I could arguably say there's when it comes to content I've done most. And I've built my network through that of saying not just that specific niche. And for me, when I was starting out, that was always the number one question. What are you, what's your focus? What's your focus? And I was like, everything. Like, what, what, what do you need me to do? Right. And I think yeah. it was just the idea. I was like, how can I chase that dollar? Plus, how can I get involved? How can I help you? How can I meet you? You know, because I, I also learned, especially Dan talks about this, of just like your network is a fast forward button to life. Mm -hmm. And so the more people I know, the more things I can get done and the more people I could serve. And I've learned that, especially living in three major cities of like, Creating content is one thing, but helping someone's another, right? Oh, yeah. and so, and when, you're always one to help. Like, 
it's not a money thing for you. You just yeah. genuinely love helping everybody. Yeah, I get that from my dad. My dad was that dude. Like, genuinely that dude. Like, growing up, homeless people, a janitor. He was just that dude. But even yeah. Dan, same way. Yeah, I think that's why another big reason why. I you guys kind of yeah, mesh well the, together. Like the baseline of it, he's just an amazing human. Oh, yeah. Like, there's no... For me, when, when I was 20... It was 20, yeah, it was pandemic, so 2019, 2020. So I was like 25, 26. I told myself that, you know, the ego of entrepreneurial, I'll never work for someone, right? And so me dropping my ego and saying, hey, I'm going to make, I made the decision from New York to LA to work for Dan. And at that time, I kept thinking to myself, if I'm going to do that, who's this human? Like baseline, no money, no network. Who is he? And the number one thing he would always talk about is charity. The other thing he would always talk about is not only like, pushing people up and, and serving them and, and, and being there for them. And I thought to myself, I was like, and he would always give hundreds of thousands of million dollars a year to charity. And I was like, this guy's doing this endlessly year after year after year. That's not a, that's not a fraud. That's not a fake. That's someone who genuinely lives it, speaks it, and it's in, it's in his blood. And so I said to myself when I made that decision to move from New York to LA, is like, I'm going to work for someone that I admire and I respect, but ultimately is a good human. And so for me, that was like actually a really, I've never spoken about that. That's like the biggest reason why of like i i looked up to him in that way of just like man this guy's constantly serving and he's showing up for people over and over and over again i was like, like i want to be like that that man i've seen him on four different flights in a day just getting from one event to the next event to yeah. the next it's like dude you're fucking nuts yeah i'm That's... with him now when i do this i know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about dan um let the people know who you're talking about and then and yeah then kind of what you're you're doing that's a together. crazy story of how i met him yeah that's a crazy story so uh dan Fleischen, the youngest person ever to take a company public um an investor in like 40 different plus companies now uh his current passion project is his 26 acre ranch uh he partnered got involved with uh, the real tarzan to create an animal conservation oh. And yep, yeah. yeah. and then um, one of his various businesses that I love and admire is uh, Cards and Coffee. So it's the I number one too. franchise Great sports card store. We'll be opening, or we, you know, part of the uh, the brand in two weeks in Mandolin Bay in Vegas. So you gotta oh, wow. come by. He's partnering with Marshawn Lynch. Dope. Yeah, so that's super cool. Great store. Yeah, uh, that'll be eight or nine. How's the total. Hollywood location doing? It's great. It's number one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, open during the pandemic. It's, it's crushing. Another passion. I love coffee. Dan loves yeah. cards. Yeah, but like, I can, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. But obviously, I'm in the sports world too. Have been a long time um, doing signings and stuff, so I know a little bit about it. It's cool, man. Yeah, it's cool that it's great. It People back, love it, you know? and I think it's very nostalgic, right? Yeah. And so that's why it's doing so well. The passion of like the bridge of the younger generation, mm -hmm. older one. And then latest, uh, his biggest project now is Money Mondays podcast that we're you know traveling yeah. around doing in an RV. That's a great, I, I thought when I, Brian sent me the episode first and uh, as soon as I heard about it, I said, oh, that's a great, that's a great plot line for, for a show, right? Yeah. yeah cool. He's always talking about money, right? And I yeah. think um, the three questions are always asked is how do you invest it? How do you make it? How do you give it away to charity? Yeah. And so that, that I think is just so cool it's kind of topics that people don't really talk about. And he's very direct and, and simple with that. Which is dope because that's what people really need to hear from something of that educational nature. And Dan Definitely. breaks it down in such a simple way and people are like, it's not that easy. It really is that easy yeah. if you follow the steps and go through yeah. it. Well, I think it's, it's it's similar to career paths and career choices that we just overthink it, right? And what I think did uh, what did Dan see in you that uh, he needed to have by his side all the yeah, time? So the, so this is the story. So this is March of 2020. Yeah, March of no March of 2019. Right before COVID. Yeah, right before COVID. March of 2019. I actually remember the day I met him. March 30th, 2020. 2019. And so I had a podcast with my who became my best friend Frankie, mm -hmm. and uh, we wanted to get guests on it. And at that time, I had a great relationship with Elena Cardone. She, she was following me on Instagram. And two things at that time, the cheapest day for flights were Tuesday. So I sent her a DM saying, Hey, Elena, I'm going to be in Miami. I had no business being in Miami and I wasn't in Miami. And I would love to get you on the podcast, even if it's for 30 minutes. She says, she responds to me and says, yeah, I'm available. We could do it inside the studio at one o'clock. This was like Sunday. I call Frankie. I'm like, yo, we got to go to Miami tomorrow. We got Elena on the podcast. We got it. We got the studio. We got it all set up. We just got to show up. So we show up, do the podcast. And while we're there, uh, one of my other best friends, Casey Adams, I don't know if you, yep. yeah. He hits me up. He's like, yo, I see you're in Miami. Um, can we? Can you meet me in Tampa? There's an event I'm speaking at. And at that time, Frankie and I, another business venture, we started a barbershop together actually in front of a university and we just opened. And or it was still going through the process of being open. We're filming stuff. I was like, dude, I can't. I got to get back to New York. Frankie overheard me 
And this just shows like lining yourself with the right people that are pushing you to do the right thing and kind of want to move you forward, even though it may take away from what you're doing with them. He still always wanted to push me and give me more and support me. He overheard me denying the opportunity to go to Tampa. And so I hang up the phone. He's like, dude, look up the event. You never know who will be there. You know, going again, it sounds pretty consistent with my story of like never knowing and just kind of take that leap of faith. I look up the event, Dan Fleischman, handful of other people, Nick Santanastaso. And he says to me, he's like, yo, let's head over to Tampa and you should film for a day. So I said, all right, cool. He's a firefighter for the state of New York. And kind of we got in a rental car for 30 bucks, drove to Tampa, had no room, check into the hotel. Uh, the next day, I'm following Casey and we're sitting at a table like this. So it's myself, Casey and Dan. And Dan slides me a sticky note. At this point, you know, I had heard of Dan two months prior, never spoken to him face to face. He wrote video question mark paid. So I'm like, I whisper at Casey, I'm like, what is this? He's like, his video guy's in here. Can you film him? Just talk about getting, I don't think he's ever heard this story. And at that time, I couldn't afford a lav mic, a lavalier mic, right? I just had my camera and road mic on. And he looks over and he's like, do you have a lav mic? I said, yeah. There was a kid in the back 10 minutes before I met a creator and I saw he had one. So I walk up to him, I'm like, hey brother, you're not gonna believe this. My lav mic is dead. My speaker's about to, oh, can I just use yours for 30 minutes? I'll bring it right back to you. So yeah, of course, I've never used this in my life. The hustle, no <laughs> way for it. I've never used this in my life. I look at him jokingly, but serious, but playing off joking. I'm like, yo, this one goes on the speaker, right? And now it's on, tap, tap, mic on, right? And I'm like looking at the levels, don't even know what that is. And he goes, bro, come on. And I was like, dude, yeah, I know. And I was like, now when I plug this into the camera, it works, right? And he goes, yeah, I'll just do it for you. I'm like, perfect. No idea. No idea. And this is 10 minutes before Dan's going. I throw on the mic, praying to God that it's running. And I set it up and I thought to myself, what can I do to make an impression on him? And so I immediately, he didn't want me to edit the video. He just gave me an email, sent it to my video editor. But I made him a 30, 45 second clip that was he could post on Instagram within 30 minutes of getting off stage. And at that point, Casey put me in a group chat with him, so I got his number. Not only did he pay me, he paid me double. And this just goes kind of the lineage of the opportunity and what could how it affected everything. Two days later, he puts me in a group chat with someone. He says, hey, this is your guy. He's based in New York. He'd shoot your course for you. Dan says that. Yeah. No idea who this guy is. The guy immediately calls me. He says, hey, Dan spoke so highly of you. I heard you're in New York. I'm shooting this online uh, course. I want to get like BTS of it, kind of, you know, the experience, the energy of it and post it on my social media. Yeah, of course, you know, Dan, I just figured it out. What do you charge? And I was like, I can't remember. It was something so baseline, quick, easy, a couple hundred bucks. I just wanted to show up and provide value. Um, and that person ended up being Charlie Walk. Charlie Walk was a massive music, you know, executive that, mm -hmm. you know, put together some of the biggest bands and supported some of the biggest artists. <laughs> and I spent, you know, the next couple months with him, getting to know his family. Uh, because of that, I shot the 2019 VMAs, had full access wow, to the 2019 that's VMAs. Yeah, that was insane. And got to travel with one of his artists that was up and coming. Simultaneously, between March and November, every month or so, Dan would put me in a group chat with someone of influence, a CEO that was in town that needed help. Uh, people from Cindy Eckert to a handful of other characters most people would know. And fast forward, he kept doing that and I kept serving his people. And he, I would never spot, talk to him, like never phone call, never text. I was, it was always group but chat. But you showed up. And yeah, I just showed up over showed and over up. and over. And he knew that you showed up. Yeah, because I was providing, you know, the content and doing yeah. whatever was needed for the people he's introduced me to. Mm -hmm. And fast forward to November of 2019, he shoots me a text, hey, are you available? It was like flying October 31st, first couple days of November, one, two, three. And I said, yes. Puts me in a group chat with the event coordinator. From that event coordinator, um, I don't ask questions. I have no idea what I'm flying into LA for. Zero. I just, same idea. He wants me here, show up. First night, it's a rented mansion and ended up being the first series of the 100 MME events. Oh, sure. So it's this $100 million mastermind that people pay $100,000 to attend. For mm -hmm. four events a year? For uh, three events a year at the time. Oh. Yep. And that first night was in a Beverly, it was in LA, Beverly Hills mansion. Again, no idea what I'm showing up for. I showed up for a suit and tie. I had a suit and tie on. If you know me now, I never wear a suit and tie. <laughs> I just, I was treating it like it was first day on the job. No idea what it was. Did he make fun of you for that? I've never, we've never talked about it. Okay. Yeah, even during the event, listen, like even the weekend to talk about that is like, we never, we didn't talk. So he shows up, there's a hundred plus people there. It's raining. It's all good. Just part of the show. And so for, for the event, I show up there and the first night he has a hundred plus people in this 
mansion and he interviews Mark Wahlberg. He flew him in on a jet to interview him with Joe Mayer nice. for 45 minutes. Yeah. So that was pretty wild. Yeah. Sounds expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go to bed and wake up and then location number two, no idea where I'm going, uh, is at Dan Bilzerian's at the house, at the time his house in Bel Air. And the it's a variety. House. The crazy, one. Right? Yeah. Is that yeah. what it's called? The one? I think um, it's called The One. I'm not now sure of the, the name. the Wish House or... But so that, it was called the one, yeah, the wild one, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was at that house, and he had a variety of entrepreneurs that I look up to that spoke on stage. Mm -hmm. And then at night, he had a charity poker tournament. Tyga performed. Nick Cannon was the DJ, and Chris Tucker was the host. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then the next day, he rented out what is the Porsche Experience uh, near yep. the airport. And when we arrived, you had the choice of being driven by professional drivers in various Porsche cars, or playing basketball with Dennis Rodman. Uh, the professor uh, dribbled too much. A handful of like well-known basketball Animal characters, guys, yeah. Matt Barnes. So, and then when you were done with that, you would go inside, and Magic Johnson gave them a motivational speech. Oh, wow. Amazing. Magic Johnson gets off, and Dan calls me over. We go into a room, and then it's Chris Jenner, Amanda Cerny, and like two other like women executives. So at the end of all this, I'm like on a super head high of like, what yeah. is going on? Like, what is this event? Like the whole time, I kept questioning my worth. You know, you're talking about the question of like, what did he see in you? I had no idea. The whole time I was there, there was like a handful of other creators. But I was like, why me? I was like, why am I here? Like, wh what's the purpose of me? Just show up. And at the end of it, I still remember this is when things were, they had breakout groups. And he went to the station area where there was like tea and stuff. And I see him alone. At this point, it's been seven plus months of endless work he's given me. I'm in LA for this event that I had no reason why I'm being there. I had never sent a word to him since. So I approach him. I went to immense grace and saying, hey, Dan, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for being, allowing me to be here in this presence of people and for you thinking for me to be able to serve you and do this. I still remember this. He grabs the, the tea, takes a sip. He looks at me and he goes, you don't know this yet, but you're moving to LA. Taps my shoulder, walks away. Like if it was God. It's a, a Dan move. Yeah. <laughs> Literally just does that, walks away. And I was like, this dude is nuts. I was like, what is he talking about li moving to LA? I was like, I was living in New York socially, work, everything else thriving. I was like, why would I ever leave New York? Dun, dun, dun. The pandemic hit. <laughs> Had me questioning everything down in Miami. And around that time, uh, he did something that made me realize the power of your network. He posted a talentless ad brand for the clothing company and he was serving and helping out there. And I saw it and I said to him, I was like, hey, I would love to do something cooler for you. I was like, I like what was done. If you send me a t-shirt, I can make a cool video. And then within seconds, he put me in touch with an executive for the company. And I was like, man, I was like that. He did it so and it's so carelessly and quickly. I was like, why wouldn't I work for this guy? Why wouldn't I take that leap of faith to like trust him and move to LA? So I did June 27th of 2020, jumped on a plane. Hi to COVID. Hi to COVID, moved into a studio apartment. Empty plane, probably. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, I have endless videos of traveling. I remember my friends just sending me pictures of like, just yeah. them on a plane empty by themselves. Oh, yeah. dude, it was yeah. great flying during that time. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's something that yes I, know, but yeah. I don't talk about is that I constantly had the leap of faith, constantly bet on myself. That was the one time in my life where I was extremely anxious and nervous. Like I still remember that day freaking out, like going on the plane. It wasn't even about the pandemic. It was just about going to LA, not knowing one soul, moving into an Airbnb studio apartment with like six other bedrooms. Like it was, I, it was one of those things where I was just doing it. Right. Took and, the leap. Yeah. And it was like mixed with that pandemic of like not having friends, no social stuff going on. Yeah. It was a very of, trying time. For yeah. It, it was, yeah. it was, it was, especially to be by yourself in a new place. Right. Yeah. Very and, and, and taking that and, and taking that leap of faith. And so kind of just going back to the question of like, what he saw me, I think it was just like, I just kept showing up. You right? show up. And right? I just, I kept doing the one thing I could do is just put in the work, like yeah. not, not just bet on myself and, just and you, do it over and over. 80% and over. of life is showing up. Maybe yeah. maybe more than that is what they like to say. It's interesting. Uh, as an actor, as a child, they always had like this is back in like the Polaroid days. So they always had like sheets of like Polaroids. all of the things that you could do. Right. Basically, they'd have you fill out like a can you ride a horse? Can you karate? Can you do this? Can you do this? So the answer to everything is always yes. Right. Because. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we could do that. We could we could do that. Yeah, definitely. You just you got to get your foot in the door first. So like with the lava mic and and figuring things out as you go is one showing up to always figuring it out regardless of the situation and what you have to do. Just, right. I'm sure people see that you're moving forward. You know, uh, sometimes you don't have to have faith in yourself for somebody else to have faith in you because they see that 
that you can handle these things in those moments. So that was it for me, especially Frankie. When I first started, he would always tell me like when I first started, he's like, you're the best videographer and content creator in the world. He would literally always tell me that. And I'm like, bro, what are you looking at? Like, seriously, what are you looking at? I would always question him. Maybe and he would he just did, put it in me. Yeah, it was that motivation of just putting yeah. in, me, in me of like, yo, I have worth that I have. That the, the st I have videos of him still. Like, I would film his reaction looking at my edited videos, and I would get a high off of that. And yeah. realizing like, yo, I'm creating something that someone enjoys. And he would always instill that in me. So I, I completely agree with that of kind of having that, that, that support of knowing like, yo, you're moving, you're going forward. And it was just him. And like my family, like had no idea what I was doing or why I was doing it, you know? And still it, it isn't until I've been doing this for six years and I could genuinely say it isn't until the past like year, two years where my family like knows what I'm doing. Like the first couple of years, they, they had no idea. So wait, did your grandma's attitude change? Yeah, she did. It did. And, and my sisters, I, I looked for validation in both of them, like immensely. There were the two people that for real mentally messed me up of like, they were questioning what I did, how I did. And I couldn't even explain it. Um, but then I realized it was the baseline of they just cared for me and they didn't want me to get hurt and they didn't want me to struggle. And so by me doing that, they felt that I f should find a new career. Right. And that they I had other smarts or other tools to then better my life. But just like anything else, it's like yeah, they see now and they're kind of like, yeah, it's just it's, it's completely opposite. Right. Like the, the tonality of it is just it's just completely different. And I think it was just the baseline. They put in the work, they see what I'm doing that, you know, I support myself and kind of, I've made something for myself and still building, but the idea of like, yeah, I'm taking care of stuff, you know, and, and kind of going back on that, something that was really special for me for the first time in my life, it was my grandmother's 86th birthday. Today is uh, Wednesday. This was last week, Tuesday. And I flew to Miami to surprise her and I took her out to dinner for the first time in my life, like just her and I and my sister. And I treated her because she's been my mother. And so even though I would let it rock, right? Like you're out with your parents, like, oh, you know, they got it. And even though it was just dinner, that was like a real fulfilling moment for me of like, like I'm doing it. You know, it's not a big deal. It's not a big purchase, not a big dinner. But the idea is like, she looked at me and she's like, you know, I'm proud of you. You know, like you're doing it, whatever you're doing. She still doesn't know. You know, okay. she just thinks I takes pictures. And yeah. that's, that part's so funny. I mean, it's also so cute because it just makes me realize like the baseline of it, she just had immense love for me and she just didn't know how to express it for me to be able to put myself in a position to win because she didn't know how to help me. Yeah. And the thing that I later then learned and realized is that that's like the pain and love of a parent, right? Of just, you want the best for them and you cannot may tell them be. what path they're going to take, but you, you do other things to yeah. kind of push them. And I think that's, what it can be did. cultural as well. Yeah, I'm Hispanic. She's Cuban. She's yeah, like poor military. Yeah, not background. just Hispanic, but but Cuban, which yeah. means different things happen for her to be here to put you in a position to do this. Yeah, you understand. Yeah. So 100%. the way no, they she, think she about left. things yeah. is is very cut and dry, right? Right. They come from a communistic background. Yes. First yeah, yeah. a republic, then a communist. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. it's my uh, my grandfather. Actually, fun fact: uh, both of them, I, my first grandfather, and my second, led the revolt against Castro. Yeah. Oh, wow. There's theaters and monuments dedicated to him, my family in, in Miami. And they had Pretty to get cool. out of there. Yep, yep. They, and leave left. behind everything they know and everything yeah. that they've owned or, or, or you yeah, know, 1962, built. she jumped on a plane. My dad was two years old. My yeah. uncle was four. Yeah, it's yeah. A, you my know, grandfather. Politi political asylum. Yeah. It's he, the he fear of Panama, fleeing your, your life for, for death because of a, you know, enemy regime, basically. Man. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a lot. And then uh, things were very... Are you Cuban? Cut and dry. No, I, I'm very familiar with the oh. with the. Uh, I lived with some Cuban people for a while, so they left. Their family left the same way. Very prominent people in Cuba, yeah. and uh, lost everything and had to re rebuild and restart over. It it just I I could tell from the way, but that a lot of these new style things are maybe very foreign to them. You know, they right. they think that you know, it's just, it's changed, right? Like just technology, right? I think that's the baseline of it. Yeah, like telling her, hey, I'm taking pictures for yeah. Jim. Well, you've seen it change. That's been used on in social years, media. In five years. Yeah, like she. Now it's even... yeah. Now it's the biggest ad platform in the world, but right. it's overnight, really, in in the sense of like the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So I want to ask two questions. Um, for the people out there that are you know into content creation, which everybody is. Yeah. First is, for a brand with a product and no social media presence that's looking to, you know, join the digital world. Um, what would be your first play? And, and from that, from that nature, you know, um, I would go through the line. What I always like to say, if you have a product or a service, 
run create videos of your frequently asked questions what is this how can i use it what is this problem because then that gives people an education on what it is right and by them you're educating them let's give an example right let's say the service is a product behind or more so a service of um throw, throw something at me here so i i could give a hat company. Uh, so let's say yeah even the bottom let's say the hat so i like the hat so the hat company um i would right off the bat number one thing tell your story how did you guys get started create a video of who the founders are who the company is because people buy into stories they don't buy into products mm -hmm. Um, they support the people behind them and then whatever which they do, which is why, especially in today's world, influencer marketing and you see people like Logan Paul, Mr. Beast, that they're finding success with their brands is because people love them. Yeah. It's not the product. It's like they're obsessed with the individual. With those promote people. It. Yeah. And they would buy anything they do. Exactly. And so that I think is the baseline of it, is the more you tell stories about who the people are and how you got started and what it is. Um, and you could do it with an iPhone. And I think that's where people think production is such a big deal where it's c the complete opposite. These UGC user generated content videos are the ones that do the best. I see that that's, that's what it is. So people think, oh, the lights, the cameras, all this stuff. It's so hard. I can't do it. We right. don't have the money for it. But right. really the new iPhone this, <laughs> is all you need. Right. Right. The front camera. Yeah. With the light, you know, you know and if you I'm can't saying? afford a light, you yeah. face a, you face a, you face a wall or sorry, you face a, a window. And just so that you're sure getting that, the nice natural yeah, that's light. That's your natural light. Yeah. You know, like there's so many things you could do. You don't have a tripod. You stack a couple books, lean it against the corner. Exactly. And I think once you set the guidelines of what this product is, how it could be used, why people love it, that gives you a foundation towards how to create additional content where I think people get lost of always creating the next video and just listening to the user, right? Look at the comments, read at what people are writing mm -hmm. and, and, and see and what they're that, actually still curious about. Correct. And, or what, did, did the best right and i think sometimes people get so caught up in when they're creating content they're thinking of themselves and not the user yeah of like hey like what what is the community talking about you know wh what are they agreeing on what are they disagreeing on okay how can we tackle that how can we create a video behind that and i think the more you make it personal is that people will buy into you going back to what i said is the products are products but people love people 100%. That just is what it is. We're in a community of constantly community, a, a community of people that all want to do one thing, right? And that's to find common ground and whatever it may be, if it's a product or a service. And so when you use your product or service to bring people together, I think you'll win. And that's why I'm obsessed with fitness gyms. And I think that's why they're, you know, people obviously during the pandemic, it was a different conversation, but the idea of like, will they be able to come back? And I, I said, yeah, because naturally human beings are meant to come together mm -hmm. and we're met, you know, we vibe off of the energies yeah, we're working out that yeah. we create for each other. Working out at your home gym was okay. But as soon as they opened back up, Every, right, everybody that, that, filed back soaring. in yeah, because soaring. the the community is what it is yeah, really selling pe that. people. Yeah. People love people. Yeah. And so the more you can tell stories about the people that use the product or service, you'll win. And I think starting is one thing, but consistency is of it all. And then talking about like podcasts is yeah. like, that's just the game. It's not the interviews that are hard. Like this is a great conversation. Yeah. Just hanging out, talking. It's, it's like, the idea of like doing it week after week. After and, after thinking week, after week. and thinking of the next guest and it can't, you don't want it to be similar to the last guest. And it's like, shit, like he and I were staring at each other the other day. We're like, this might get a little harder. It just, you know, finding, you know, I think Joe Rogan said it a lot early on is like, he was like, anybody with a crazy story? Yeah. Tarantulas, oh, oh, lizard people, giants. Come on, man. Let's talk about <laughs> yeah. it. You want to talk about it for three hours? Come on. You know what yeah. I mean? And then as the show progressed and became what it is, you find your, your, your thing and the guests come, they kind of come to you. So question number two, uh, for somebody that doesn't have a product or service, that's just into content creation, maybe somebody that's young, um, maybe that's somebody's product or service that they, they want to create as themselves. What would be your advice to build following or scale, you know, their, their creation yeah. ideas, tips? Great question. So the first thing I would say is build your portfolio. How do you build your portfolio? Your friends and family. There's always a family event going on. And so you immediately tackle most things, weddings, baptisms, bar mitzvahs, uh, birthday celebrations, graduations. And I think you serve through that. Sorry. I think that, is that my phone? Is that my phone? My bad. If it was. Oh, okay. So th through family events is how you'll create the content. And that is how you'll create your portfolio that then you can leverage to then sell yourself to those people that are there. Nine out of 10 times, especially if you're at a birthday party, a kid's birthday party, the parents that are there have their kids and their birthdays are coming up. 
And then nine out of ten times, what I always like to do is you wander the room and let them know, hey, if you have something coming up, I would love to help in any way. And then they'll say they'll say to you, great, give me a business card, let me get your number, and you immediately follow up. And not only do you follow up with your greeting and reminding them who you are, you send them a personalized photo that you captured of their family. So now they really remember you. So oh, in the wow. text thread, yeah, the text thread then becomes the photographer too. I remember that photographer. He sent me the photo that same day. Look how nice this photo is. I want to book him for X, Y, and Z. Um, and I would do that endlessly over and over and over. And over time, you'll then convert into selling yourself to do other things. One thing is a restaurant. You walk into a local restaurant. Don't just tell them what you do. Order food, create a hype video, and then show it to them. Provide the value and then sell yourself. And then they'll see the value in it because of what they want. And then they may not need it, but you tell them how you could provide value of what they're currently doing and how you could serve them. And I think if you do that time and time again, you'll create a, a good basis of, of income for yourself, ranging from five hundred to a thousand dollars. And people sometimes think you need to, it needs to be a fifteen, twenty thousand dollar client. Like the frequency of that is not often, right? No, that's big budget. It, yeah, and it, and even then, not to say it's not realistic because that's not the word. I think just someone who's starting out is like take the little pieces of the cake, they add up. Five hundred yeah. bucks here, five hundred bucks there. You have two five hundred dollar events a week. You're making four grand a month. Exactly. You know, it's the consistency, right? It's $52,000 a year. Double it. Yeah. Then double it again. Yeah. Four a week. You're, you're making a hundred grand. There you go. So I think people sometimes like to overthink it and just say to yourself, it's like, who do I know? How can I serve them? And what's the type of content I could provide? And for someone who, again, who's starting out, doesn't know there's great resources like YouTube and Instagram. hundred percent. I become obsessed with just watching what other people are doing. And then that gives me inspiration to do it and then provide the same type of content or something similar in my own fashion to a client. And then reading the con uh, the comments as well, because like right. you said, that's a good point is that, you know, how the people are re not just creating something, but how the people are reacting to what has been created is right. really the key in finding the value of it. Right. Yeah. I would still let you know because the, the comment section is like they're ruthless. bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just like you were saying before we came on the show, the water bottle being on the table. Yeah, you know, and I, yeah, I was talking about having a some type of uh, some type of you know alkaline water, and then obviously somebody that sold Kangen or whatever, like that that water's trash, Chance. We got to get you lined up with blah 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 blah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it's all out there. Yeah, yeah. people are paying attention. When it comes to content, I say if you motivate, educate, or inspire, you'll create a following. Um, and and one more time, motivate, motivate, educate, and inspire. Yeah. You do one of the three or two of the three, you'll find success in your content. And the ending of it all too, is just like being true to yourself of what you're creating. If it's for you or for a client, just make sure that you're aligned with what's going on. Because the biggest thing that you don't want is to be creating content for people or kind of services or products that it sounds cliche, but it's so true because you'll start to disalign yourself and then kind of push yourself away from what you're enjoying, which is creating content. And I think as content creators, we sometimes not only overthink things is that will service things to just make it happen. But ultimately you want to do something that is really fueling you and saying to yourself, wow, this is like, I'm creating this video. I'm taking these photos to promote this product or service that I really believe is cool. Or I really believe is having a real purpose. Um, and then I, that's where I think you find the true passion in it of kind of saying to yourself like, okay, cool. Not only am I creating content, but the people I'm doing it for and the product or service that I'm promoting has, has a real positive influence or kind of, you know, purpose behind it and community that is strong. Yeah. I've noticed even switching up my content from the gun stuff to more of like motivational stuff. When I don't post it, I get texts, DMs. They're like, where's my motivation? I'm like, you guys actually like this stuff? Yeah. And I think it's all perspective, right? Of kind of, when it, when it comes to content, I think we, we love to consume things that is shareable, right? You want to be able to, you know, the motivational stuff is great because you want to be able to share that with your friends. And I think when it comes to not only motivation is the re relatability behind it of creating stuff that can relate to other people. I think that's why there's so much success with meme pages is that it's just relatable and they're doing things or saying things that people don't say out loud and they just they show it through text or videos and kind of no oh, a good meme it, goes viral real quick yeah and it, it's just, the idea is a like, good meme can topple a government or change the course of a fortune 500 company real yeah. quick for real <laughs> you know i don't know have you guys seen lately the ai generated photos yeah the they're one wild that went bro. viral yesterday with donald trump yeah of him getting arrested that was that's scary, scary. 
Well, I mean, yeah. Elon We've has had, been warning people about AI that, for how years. How dangerous AI actually and it, and it is. Looks, it looks so real. Oh, like, and that, in full blown getting tackled, hold, held by. Let's police. imagine that that's probably old technology too. No, we don't have, like us regular people don't have, have access to the crazy version. Well, they've, I mean, it was probably made for, everything's made for the industrial military complex and it was probably made for them 10 years ago, right? Yeah. But I think that's also a great example for content creators is that the idea of like, there's things that are constantly being innovated and you got to like know. Stay ahead of it. Yeah. Not even ahead. I think it's more so just know what's going on and then how you can compete in the market. Mm -hmm. Stay in the trend. Yeah. Just know what's going on. And I think that's so important where like I, something that I did is that when I was starting out, you know, I didn't have much of a quote unquote community. It was a, I started about like six, eight months ago. I have a handful of creators from all over the country that I have in our Instagram group chat. And I literally told them the first paragraph that I wrote in that group chat, this is meant to motivate each other, inspire each other and educate on content. If you do anything outside of that, you'll be removed from the group. And someone yesterday posted about, Hey, look at this. Adobe just created these new AI photos. You guys should start watching videos and learning about it. And the idea is that I'm nowhere near perfect and I'm nowhere near where I want to be. But the idea is like you have, especially as a creator, you have to be cultivating yourself and pushing yourself to know what's hot and then also know what are people looking at and how you can get ingrained in that to then service the people. It's also nice to have different eyes on things too as well, right? right. So, so creating something or a, a safe space for all of us to grow together right, um, is a great thing as the industry can become an industry, right? Um, speaking of AI, let's... Uh, pick your brain a little bit about that for a second. Um, so for a content creator out there, what are a few prompts that um, you think would bring value to them using something like chat GPT for? Yeah, I think it becomes, what would you ask? A, what yeah, would you yeah. ask your robot, your <laughs> robot to do for you? You know? Yeah. Um, when, when it comes to chat GPT, I think it was a, another viral video I saw yesterday is that a, a college professor caught half of the class using it to prompt them the same answers and i so i i thought that was really interesting because it made me think about creativity creativity using creativity to knowing what's going on and also to not quote unquote copy other people i think what chat GPT does is seeks and discovers new ways of thinking and how to answer certain things um, but for me personally i think the thing that i don't look forward to is that people just using that and as a lean can be on. very stale right correct of like the idea is like for me i think the beauty behind just being a content creator is that i always say to people is like a quote quote of the lens through your eyes no one else sees it because of your experiences who you met and what you've done and the point you are in your life 100 percent. and so as a content creator i i like to think that the beauty behind what we do is i see it in a different way as you do and you do. And that even though we could be in the same place, we could still take different photos of the same thing. And being a content creator, I would say towards chat GPT is that use it as a path, but don't allow it to decide your steps. Meaning is that he could, it'll put you in the right direction. It'll give you the right information, but don't be dependent on that. The use it as be, a tool. Correct. But really the idea is what I'm trying to tell you is like, don't lose your creativity based off a of software that's deciding for you. Gotcha. Allow it to make a path for you and make that line and take those kind of the right to mindset. Be an assistant. You're right, the right mindset, but don't let it take the steps for you. Yeah. Like the beauty behind being a content creator is you trying it, you failing, you trying yeah, it. Yeah, seeing what works, you what doesn't. Yeah, you trying it and then getting that natural, what I like to call the head high of like, man, that came out so cool. I did that. You may have done it by mistake or it may have been coordinated, but the idea is that you created that. And that's the one thing that I don't want is like as content creators for software is to constantly be just buttons and then it just happens. Yeah. It's like, there's a beauty behind the lack in the creation, the, the, the creation of it, of like the self-fulfillment. And there's the so much more that comes to it of yeah. like, you know, there's artists that talk about like just picking up the brush and just being able to, the motion of it, there's beauty behind that, you know, and there's beauty behind a content creator, put cultivating clips together, putting things together, seeing that vision of what it could be like. Versus just throwing it in a software and it doing it for you. We need to uh, use it to empower us, not to power us, right? Right. That's exactly it. That, that's just the number one thing I don't want, especially for young creators, is that them thinking that's the only tool, so then it becomes the standard. What do you think of all this rain we've been getting in Los Angeles? It's nuts. 
It's in actually Florida, nuts. so you're used to like yeah. Hurricane real season rain. was different. This is lately. It's been wild. The hurricane season was over. Yeah, it, it's been nuts. We're gonna wrap up with uh, two things. First, um, anything you'd like to share with us that you're working on? Um, anything you got in development, and what can we look forward to from you in the future? So the biggest thing for me as a content creator, I've done a great time spending my presence with work and knowing that there's only so many places I could be at once, right? Which is one. And knowing that number two is how can I serve further content creators by not only education, but ultimately giving them business opportunities. And so I'm com coming out with a company called Creator Galaxy. And this company will essentially connect business owners and creators for jobs and sites. So the example is if I'm a content creator based in LA or vice versa, let's say the business owner and I have an event coming up, I have a budget of a thousand dollars. I'm looking for a specific type of work of a video reel. You run through our filters and within seconds we connect you with the content creator. That's amazing. They, yeah, they, they accept the gig. We take the funds from the business. You do the job. Then the, the, all the conversations, all the uh, work is then transferred over to the business owner. They give the green light and then we pay the creator immediately. That makes life a lot easier because people always hit me up. They're like, you had a, a content creator. I was like, I don't share my guy. You yeah. got to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is that one, it'll give business owner content creator opportunities. And then two content creators not only work, but the opportunity to travel. So I want to launch them across like the major cities. And then, uh, then that'll lead into what I believe will be a big, big passion project of mine, which will be like content CEO, creator galaxy retreats. And that will bring it like full circle where online meets presence of online creators coming together. I want the number to be around 10 to 20 intimate experience. I'm educating them throughout the day in the evenings. Uh, they're spending time with models that I've flown in to then apply what I taught them that same morning um, and to create content. So that's something I'm looking forward to. I think that's something that the market needs and uh doing is this gonna things. be a physical experience to start or will it be digital uh so the creator galaxy is a dot com site uh-huh it's actually already done and that will then ultimately what I, going back to what we said at the beginning of the podcast community mm -hmm. you know, in-person experience and then the retreats will be the in-person experience by cool. being a member be a, being a part of that online yeah. community and so, being able to you know take what you've learned digitally and then apply it in a right and then and, and also meet the people that, that are all were, involved yeah, yeah, that, yeah that are part of the community and then getting them together and then being able to learn from each other and so balancing that with traveling with dan is being in every city wherever he needs me <laughs> yeah so. creator galaxy great idea um i, love I think it. it has tons of value for for this uh burgeoning field that, that you're in you know right and that you're kind of you know evolving in as it evolves itself that's right. awesome um Great idea. Uh, one last thing, uh, you know, what would you like to leave the audience with, um, either personal or entrepreneurial or business-wise, just something that you'd like to, you know, you think that maybe is often overlooked, but uh, that you'd like to share for all the other people out there? Yeah, if, you, if you're a creator starting out and you don't know where to go or what to do, uh, just get started and just get started by doing it for yourself and not looking for approval from the people around you. Don't, you don't have to tell everyone what you're doing. You don't have to tell everyone what your next steps are. What you have to do is just trust on what you have going on, build yourself, and then the world will see it. Sometimes as creators, we sometimes seek validation through our likes or comments and our views. And sometimes that it just takes time, right? And I've realized that the patience in that game of doing something for yourself and not for others especially as a content creator, we're constantly looking again for validation from people to accept our work. And when, you, when you're just getting started, it's not easy. When you're just getting started, it's not going to be, you know, it's all sunshine and rainbows. But ultimately, when you show up and you do it over and over again, you start to figure out your path and you make your steps and whatever that may be in whatever career. But j just show up and do it for you. Don't, don't look for validation from other people. Uh, because you'll then realize that you're living for others and not for yourself. I like it. Yeah. It took me a while to figure that part out a, a very long time. I mean, we're all one day at a time, right? We're yeah. all trying to figure this thing out as we go. And yep. that's the beauty of a uh, shared space. And, uh, you know, like, like you said, with creator galaxy, it's like, you know, getting a group of people in a shared space digitally or physically and, uh, watching a uh, community evolve into, you know, something bigger than itself we've seen you know monolithic companies arrive you know 
just recently from NFT space to crypto space to this and that and uh, gain crazy market share and value over overnight almost, you know? Yeah. So it's it's really about shared space and communities build bridges and that's dope. Thank you guys for having me on. This is fun. Appreciate you coming out, Roger. Yeah. Of course. This is dope. Uh, like, subscribe, comment. Comment, sure. If you got a comment. <laughs> See you guys on the next one.